When we think of Bruce Lee, it's almost impossible to separate the man and his successes from his theory and philosophy, his clarity and goal setting, his fortitude and mindset, and the unyielding actions that made his success possible. Today on the Magnetic Marketing Podcast, we get to listen to Dan Kennedy and Dwight Woods. Now, Dwight Woods was the owner and chief operator at a martial arts academy in Miami that teaches Bruce Lee's style and philosophy of Jeet Kune Do. Now, this podcast is filled with quotable moments and things that you're going to want to hold on to. So as you were reflecting on your personal journey, your personal fortitude, the clarity of your goals, where you were trying to go, pay attention for that nugget that you need, the thing you can write on the wall, the thing you can put on your phone that is going to help change the game for you and unlock that next step of your success. Let's get started. I don't think there's anybody that has had a bigger impact in the field of direct response than Dan Kennedy. The legend of Dan Kennedy should be ignored at your own peril. They're not really lessons, they're kind of laws that you live by. Dan opened my eyes to what small business marketing looks like. Dan teaches strategic direct response that is timeless. His ripple effect touches people who don't even know his name. The world as we know it was changed because Dan Kennedy became obsessed with marketing. Welcome to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast with your host, Dan Kennedy. Welcome to another Diamond Call. Uh, We have somebody who clearly everybody knows because he's with very rare exception like in hospital or dying or something um, is the fast fingers first guy through on every diamond call uh, and has been for I forget a number of years Um, beyond him being aggravating in that way you may or may not know but uh, Dwight uh, is the owner and the chief instructor at the Unified Martial Art Academy in beautiful Miami Florida where he uses Bruce Lee's martial art and the philosophy of Jeet Kune Do. Um, Bruce Lee, if you guys don't know, you probably ought to. Go, it's worth googling Bruce Lee because there's a big background story there. There's connection to Napoleon Hill. Um, not that it's his greatest claim to fame, but some of you might know him from the Green Hornet television show. Um, in any case. Uh, It is a very particular um, balanced approach, uh, not just uh, to the ability to rip people's heads off with your bare hands, uh, but to success in life. And um, most recently, Dwight's uh, venturing beyond local boundaries of that school with membership sites and coaching groups and concierge Jeet Kune Do, which is uh, aimed at affluent clients, um, and uh, and so forth. So um, we're sort of turning the tables a little bit on this call. Dwight has always had a high level of fascination in the sort of productivity category, um, and so as most of you know. I'm sort of obsessive about it myself, and so I'm going to let Dwight take over the call, and uh, we're going to have a discussion about what interests him uh, in that category. (laughs) Okay, well, um, so my original idea was the topic should be the no BS psychology and philosophy of success, because if I remember correctly, the invitation from you was to plumb the depths of your mind on specific topics. But somehow the uh, the title uh, became Accelerated Achievement. So I'm going to kind of work with that title that was imposed on us. And um, I wanted to start with this. Give me then, or give us, I should say, your definition of Accelerated Achievement. And I'm setting you up for something here, just so you know. All right, well, regardless of what you're setting me up for, I mean, uh, you know, sort of sort of the watchword of recent years and certainly today is speed. In business, it's speed to market. Um, and uh, most people are 
uh, impatient anyway. So, uh, so speed's important. People want to know how to get from point A to point B um, uh, in the fastest period of time possible. Uh, and so that factors in. Um, I think that uh, there's always caution about, as Drucker pointed out, efficiency at at the expense of effectiveness. But um, I do work a lot with clients where we, um, uh, to use the phenomenon tagline, where we do get more done, more accomplished, um, uh, more goals achieved in a short period of time than had been achieved in a much longer period of time. And so the acceleration part is sometimes about removing obstacles, sometimes it is about new opportunities, sometimes it's just about focus, uh, getting somebody to pick three out of 30 um, and and focus their resources on them. Uh, Achievement, of course, is, is, is done, not doing or going to do, Um, And so it is whatever objectives people define. Um, I think Paul Myers' quote about that is as good as any, which is when most people aren't getting what they want out of life or you can substitute business or business life if you like. It's because their goals are not clearly enough defined. So a lot of people are um, in pursuit of vague pictures of where they're trying to get. Um, And, um, you know, that's sort of like the difference of where you might wind up if you set out to drive to Pennsylvania or drive to Pittsburgh or drive to a particular address uh, in Pennsylvania. And a lot of people are at the Pennsylvania stage or the Pittsburgh stage, not at the particular address stage. And those two things hook together because, Acceleration is impossible without clarity. So if if anybody was expecting um, shortcuts to achievement or or you giving us the insider secrets, then this might not be the call? Well, it, it, it's sort of like Clinton and the meaning of the word is uh, to the <laughs> word shortcut. Um, I mean, the way most people think about shortcuts is – Uh, has making something easier, has eliminating the work. Right, not having to do, that's exactly, yeah, not having to do the work. And and no, this would would be the wrong call and I would be the wrong guy. (laughs) I mean, most, virtually all high achievers in any field um, are at whatever it is they're at, uh, early and late, um, and are, working uh, harder at it, now not dumb harder, but harder at it Mm -hmm. than virtually all of their peers, and in many cases, then they make it look. Um, So uh, for a variety of reasons, a lot of people like to keep their sausage factory completely hidden and only show the sausage. And that uh, it's okay, you know, as long as you're not deluded by it as an observer. Uh, so, no, I, I never define shortcut as, as an erasure of work. Right. Now, on the other hand, I don't want to drive from Ohio to Pennsylvania by going to California either. And so it is about what will get us to the defined objective, Um with the best combination of efficiency and effectiveness, the best combination of directness first. Um, but in a lot of cases, you really can't leap steps either. Yeah. So, so you know, in, in a narrow example, as you know, today's phone day for me, so I've been on the phone since 7 this morning. Right. And, and, and I've had variations of this conversation with a couple of clients. I mean, so one... Who, who's working with Fred Katona? I mean, our our objective is for this advertiser to be able to to be a a major daily advertiser on the Limbaugh a radio program. Mm-hmm. But the way for that to happen is not just to whip out the checkbook, write a big check, 
and slap your radio commercial on Limbaugh uh, because it's very expensive uh, to play in that arena. Uh, you only get one chance to do well in that arena, etc. So now there's going to have to be a series of somewhat painful experiments run in a matrix of local markets moving up to syndicated radio. And, of course, it isn't just the radio spot that has to work. It's what the radio spot is driven to has to work, right. what the actual offer is, on and on and on and on and on. Yeah. So, you know, the shortcut would be, well, let's just test five different spots on Limbaugh and let's write a big check. But yeah. it would be a stupid shortcut. Yeah. So in, in a recent Diamond Facts, right, you talked about um, – and I wish I had been there to see the look on the guy's face. You talked about a speaker who said he hoped that he was going to do well, and you said that um, you were going to do between eighty-seven and one hundred twenty-five thousand, or you're going to be really pissed. Yeah. All right. And so he says to you, "Well, how, how do you get those numbers?" And then you go through the one, two, three, four, five, six, almost seven things that you had done to come up with that number. Right now, so does that qualify as a shortcut? Well, let me say this: it's it's actually more about effectiveness than efficiency. But so, in in a big broad sense, expectations govern results, right? But a lot of people take that idea and they have it over way over sort of on the metaphysical side in the in the same arena has uh, depending on what branch of that thinking you want to go to whether you want to go to peel and positive thinking or you want to go to the manifestation guys they they have it over there on that side where if i just have an expectation in my head that's good enough um but it really Expect a better way to say it would be expectations that you have good reason for well, govern now, a did, result. Did you ever fall for that? For um, the positive mindset thinking? Oh yeah, very early, very right. briefly. And what um, got you out of it? Uh, reality, starvation, <laughs> not eating. Um, um, because. It doesn't work, and it's just a question. So, so a lot. See, a lot of people would rather have their delusions right. than do the difficult work of figuring out how to make reality profitable and productive. And so, some people cling to these delusions their entire life. Um, but it, it, it doesn't really take very long, you know, if you're a reasonable human being, to to conclude. Uh, as I did, that a whatever now terminology you want to use, positive expectancy, uh, a, a motivated attitude, uh, visualization, all that stuff um, is really no better than a really negative, cynical, ugly view of the world. Um, if you can't get yourself in front of people who are willing and able to exchange money for whatever deliverable you have to offer. And so of the two, if you had to make a choice between mindset and marketing, you'd take marketing any day of the week. Right. Because even somebody with a terrible mindset can make a living with good marketing. Right. Uh, Somebody with a great mindset will find it very hard to make a living with really bad marketing. Um, uh, obviously having both is the preferred state of being. Mm -hmm. Um, But so, yeah, I mean, I tell the story. I was driving around for a brief period of time in an old beat-up car with the front seat covered with motivational tapes. And and it took me a little while to figure out that the motivational tapes and the listening to them alone was not going to change the car um, or the bank account that was attached to the car. Uh, so yeah, briefly. Okay. So we've 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 established uh, 
two things then. Um, we're not going to be able to avoid having to work hard, and we're not going to be able to avoid having to work smart. Um, so, and, and, and really, why would we? <laughs> see, see I, I really question the – see, I, I think people who really seek that are almost always disappointed when they get it. Um, we're – we, I think, are hardwired, and so we act against our hardwiring when when we strive to be liberated from work. I think it's much more uh, sensible to try and find uh, work that is, A, not onerous, uh, B, that at least some parts of it are interesting to you that in some way are meaningful um, so that you derive psychic satisfaction from the work because it's hard to derive psychic satisfaction from a vacuum. Okay. Um, I had a conversation not long ago with one of our members who a few years back sold a company for a very large sum of money and at a young age intended to retire. And he found himself uh, every once in a while getting on an airplane and flying to Vegas and gambling just because he was bored. And he was sitting at a blackjack table playing 1000 bucks a hand in the middle of the day on a weekday. There was hardly anybody else there. And the dealer said, sold your company, huh? <laughs> And the guy said, well, how would you know that? And he said, because you're sitting here in the middle of the afternoon idly and casually playing $1,000 a hand. And he said he decided at the end of that day, he got on a plane, went home, said to his wife, I'm getting back in business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got uh, – there's, a, there's a, a phrase that I heard you say uh, uh, one time ago, and uh, – I want you to clarify it for me then. It was at the 2007 Sales Strategy Seminar, and you said there is no sense in getting rich slowly. So if we know we got to do some work, all right, um, explain then to me what you mean by that. Well, There's first of all, working with money is generally, usually, more both more productive and more enjoyable than working without it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, better to as quickly as possible, get in a position of having significant resources to employ uh, rather than spending any longer than is necessary um, uh, getting by with, uh, with rubbing sticks together and duct tape. Um, uh, I've done both. And while it is true that if you can't make money without money, you probably won't make money with money, it is also true that if you do have the skills to make money, you will almost always make a lot more money with money to work with than without it. So, you know, there are reasons that the rich get richer and the poor stay poor or get poorer. And some of it is because they think differently. Right. But also it is true <laughs> that uh, that money attracts money, um, that the ability to buy expertise – the ability to overpay for certain services in order to get the best, uh, the ability to buy speed. Um, so like the stupid test in our example before would be to go to Limbaugh. But now the smart test is begins with how many different commercials, how many different websites you drive them to, how many different offers, and how many follow-up direct mail campaigns, and how many stations can you test all in the same week. Because if you had to test one at a time, it may take you two years to run that test. So I can buy speed with money. And there are certain kinds of speed you can only buy with money. Um, you can actually overpay for future value, which you can't do when you don't have money. So if you study Trump and you, and you read George Ross's book or you listen to Ross when he spoke at the super conference. That guy is scary. Well, he is scary. Um, he's really a very nice guy, by the way. 
Now, he would cut your arm off at the elbow in a business deal. Don't, yeah. mis- uh, don't misunderstand. But, <laughs> but other than that, he's a very nice guy. <laughs> but, but, I mean, if you pay attention to them, uh, they both make it very clear, he and Trump, that by objective standards, all of Trump's great deals have involved Trump being thought an idiot by many, including the seller, for grossly overpaying for the asset he bought. Right. But he has the wherewithal to buy speed in the form of the future value he's going to create. Whereas without money, you can't do that. You actually have to only buy things where you can find present value at a discount. So, you know, if you have to buy your real estate with no money down and bad credit and create equity through sweat by fixing things up, you can only buy foreclosures on the bad side of town, et cetera, et cetera. If you have money right now, you can come down to Florida where you live and you can buy really good property um, and pay present day value with no discounts um, and know that there's at least 25% appreciation to come. And so if you give up 10 of that, even by buying the nicest property in an area at above what the others are selling for right now, you're still going to be 15 points ahead. So, you know, and the flip side of that statement is there's no virtue in getting there slow. Um, you, you, you don't get a bonus at the bank when you go in to make the deposit and tell everybody it took you 10 years to make the money. That was the, day. that was the other part of the statement that I could not remember. There was a, there, yeah. I knew it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, you know, there's no, there's no reward right. for the virtue of making it slow. But what about when you start? You try, you so-called fail at it, and you get discouraged. Well, again, here we have acceleration by some means important Mm -hmm. uh, because the way most people get so discouraged that they quit is that, well, they either have an inaccurate view of success and failure versus testing in the first place, Mm -hmm. or they get so discouraged that they quit because they are failing so slowly. Um, They are, they're moving at such a slow pace that the light at the end of the tunnel is so far away it's invisible. So it's not massive simultaneous action. Yeah, I mean, see, so, I mean, almost, almost everybody that gets to, to wins fails more than they win doesn't matter if it's a salesperson making sales presentations i mean you're you're a good closer um but still uh in most selling environments you are going to miss more than you get Mm -hmm. and and there's somewhat there's a little bit of randomness to all that but then we follow up on them mercilessly well of course (laughs) Uh, but so if you take somebody off the street and we're going to teach him how to be in direct sales, and we're going to teach him to sell, I don't know, burglar alarms in the home. If he makes only one presentation a week, uh, the national average in that business is is a one out of eight close. Uh, The best guys are close on one out of four. So if he's not even up to average yet, he may need 12 presentations to close a sale. If we have him make one a week, we are we could be three months away from a success, and he's going to get discouraged and quit. So we got to figure out how to condense um, the number of presentations into a short period of time, not to really materially affect the rate of failure. The rate of failure is probably going to be the same. It's just that it's going to be over so fast. Right. And he'll get to his success fast enough right. uh, that, encouraged. that we'll be able to build on that. Yeah. And, and so people do the same thing to themselves when they're learning to sell from the platform, uh, which it's more difficult to get reps. Um, but, you know, when I was fixing a speaker and I knew I had to fix him, so he's no good at it, 
and we want to make him good at it. Um, Foster Hibbard, the example, I didn't book one seminar, figure we'll go out there and do it and come home and reconnoiter and and go back out two weeks later and do it again. I knew that'd be a, that would be hopeless. I booked 10 nights in a row. Um, so we're going to fix on the fly. Right. Um, uh, and, and, and so people really need to do the same thing for themselves in whatever it is they're setting out, okay. you know, to do from scratch or to improve on. All right. So I got so far mindset, um, clarity of goals, massive simultaneous action, and then the concept of failing fast. Yeah. All right. Okay. What about list building? <laughs> Not what you think. It, it's something that um, I think it was Matt Fury I, I saw do it quite simply. And it's making the list of the things that you want to, that, that you can do to make money or that you want to have in your life. And then the second list is the things that you can do to get those things. Yeah, well, there, there's others. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, there is the list of stuff you want to get rid of, <laughs> um, which... Um, which, you know, I, I, I remake that list every year. It's the closest thing to sort of New Year's resolutions that I ever do. Right. Um, is the list of stuff I don't like um, that I'm involved with one way or another uh, that I'd like to get rid of. Um, and, and and so most people, by the way, can can make that list quicker than any other list. And there's nothing wrong with making that list. I don't care whether it's, um, you know, like Jeff Paul's big deal about the financial planning business above all else is he never wanted to have to wear a tie again as long as he lived. Well, okay. I mean, not that big a thing to me, uh, not that I wear them very often, but if that's a big thing to you, by all means, uh, let's figure out how you can remake your life so so you don't ever have to wear a tie again. Um, I tell the story of consulting with Rob Minton in the real estate business when he had a long, long, long list of all the stuff he didn't like about the real estate business. Um, uh, so, you know, he didn't like doing open houses and he didn't like doing listing presentations and he didn't like taking people around and showing them houses. Um, and he didn't want, he didn't like carrying them big, heavy signs and sticking them in and out of the yard. And, you know, by the time he got done, the only thing left in the real estate business was cash and a commission check, uh, which we all like. And, you know, then I said, well, is there anything at all about this business you actually do like besides the money you're making? He said, well, I really kind of like dealing with the few investor clients I got because they don't care what the kitchen countertop looks like. Half the time they don't even go look at the houses. They're basically dealing with numbers and they have more value because – I can only sell John and Mary a house once this year, but I can sell the investor three houses. I make money twice because I get to sell it again for the investor. Right. So I get a commission going in, a commission going out. They don't bother me. They don't call me on weekends. And so the answer to all of that um, is blindingly obvious to somebody who's not living it, which is only deal with investor clients. Yeah. Um, and, and and so that list is useful. Um, the list of what you want is useful. I often have people divvy it up short-term, medium-term, long-term. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, the list of now what you can do about it um, uh, 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 and what you can do about it right now with the right. resources you got. Right. What resources you need, you need to, to get. Yeah, what information you need to get. What yeah. information you need to get. What people you need to go find and meet. Um, uh, but again, look at how much work you're creating. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so you, you take something as simple as coming to a conference. So I just came out of the mailbox millions thing. Mm-hmm. and But if you think about that or you think about a super conference, it doesn't matter. So the small percentage of the people who come and really get a lot from it that can accelerate their achievement, they come there to work 
and they come there and work. They have lists ahead of time of what we just said, what information I need to get, what contacts I need to make, what resources I need to find, what questions I need to get answered. Um, They visit with every exhibitor. You know, so like I had a few calls this morning of people who were at Mailbox Millions. And, you know, they made a point of meeting with every exhibitor. Uh, 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 They've already had follow-up calls. They've implemented. They've got uh, Bill Gow, who markets to all state agents, very, very successful info marketer, um, has already got a brand-new four-step campaign which he's completely having implemented for him by, by direct mail concierge. Um, Lisa Miller went home and is only days away from sending me the rough of the catalog that she's preparing of all their company services based on what we talked about at the seminar about catalogs. So, But how do most people come to a conference? Completely unprepared. Right. They essentially come like they were going to a concert, and they sit in a chair to be entertained. Um, They hang out with the same eight people they know through the entire time of the conference. You know, they don't work. Now, what's significant about that, and it is significant about the whole work conversation, is they put in the same time. Yeah. They haven't saved any time. (laughs) Yeah. They've been there for the same three days. Mm -hmm. The question is, what did you do with the three days? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So lack of lack of preparation beforehand. You know, I I was talking with somebody the other day, and and I said to him, you know, it's even like parents who know that they have to have a discussion with the kid about doing not doing so well in school, and they don't even prepare for the discussion. They just go in. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, most people do phone conversations the same way. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, the people I work with don't, at least with me, because they learn, you know, that that's going to get their knuckles wrapped. Well, how how long ago do you think I started working on this one? And because, yeah, well, I'm sure you put time into this. Um, uh, And, um, but, you know, most people don't. Yeah. I mean, most people pretty much show up, you know, and then sort of. Whatever happens, happens. Yeah. And, you know, George Bush's W's line about that was a very good line. You know, if you don't have an agenda, others will be perfectly happy to impose theirs on you. Yeah, they will. Um, and, and, and so I find that for every conversation, every meeting, um, uh, every conference, um, it, it's useful to have an agenda. Let's see if we can cover um, the, these two things. I, I heard uh, Joe Polish use a phrase uh, recently, marketing stamina. All right. Um, give us a tip then on developing that stick to because that's what it's going to take, and we don't want to get discouraged Right, we want to keep going. It, you know, I teach, I, t- I teach a thing, um, the, the the mastery path. You know, where I show people how you join, you start training, your level goes up, but then you plateau, and a lot of times, it's on that plateau that people get frustrated because they don't feel like they're advancing, and that's when they're inclined to quit, without understanding that the plateau is an integral part of the entire development. So, how do we? cultivate marketing stamina well see, i'm not sure what he was referring to i mean there there's several there's several aspects about all of that there is there is the whole mindset category and and how you approach the marketing within business or business overall um what your what your vision is, what your plan is, um, uh, how clear you are about benchmarks and progress points and steps and all of that. There is the issue of resources. Um, And so uh, to use the word stamina, I mean, there is the issue of money, um, uh, capital, churn of capital, how fast you can 
put the same dollar back out there into the marketplace um, uh, 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 margin. You know, how tight or how good your profit margin is is going to have a whole lot to do with sustainability. Um, so there are there's sort of the the money math of the whole thing to put yourself in a position uh, 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 to press on. Right. Um, there is the um, there is the most pragmatic thing I can say. Kind of loops back to I think the first question and answer is that um, business owners are well served by putting in place something that that steadily brings them, um, predictably brings them, reliably brings them at least a base flow of prospects, customers, revenue, yeah. uh, a, a profitable activity. Um, the, the, the businesses that are fragile have large um, spikes up and down or big spikes and then big dormant periods. They're dependent in one way or another on the next hit. So it's the way movie studios used to be run. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, uh, it's the way the online launch folks operate. And the problem with that is, is that one thing doesn't go well, and it really may represent a six-month or two-year gap um, in revenue. And mo- a lot of people won't have the staying power, you know, to survive that. Right. Um, uh, I think that, uh, again, not wanting to do the work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in, in direct marketing, the most difficult thing to create is is evergreen, is the thing that, just can be used month after month after month after month after month with the same efficacy uh, four years from now as it was now. Most difficult thing to create. The most valuable thing to create because now it provides a solid uh, a base to stand on. Have you ever taught um, a concept such as uh, how should I express this? We call it trick of the month, and, and and it's like, okay, here's you can spend five minutes a day for the next thirty days on something to get better at it. And I was thinking about it in preparation for this call, and I thought, well, wait, what if I think that my copywriting skill is not up to where it should be? If I work on that a few minutes every day for a month. and So I've taught it in martial art, and I just wondered if you had ever taught something, heard of such a concept or something. So what do you do? You focus them on one move? Well, it it might not even be one. Yeah, it could even be that, yes. Well, um, I've not really learned that way personally. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, giving it a moment or two of thought, it might have been a less painful way to learn a few things than the way I did learn them. Um, when you when you attach it to something that has a lot of moving parts, like copywriting, um, again, as long as somebody had the big vision and the staying power to get through the two years, let's say, yeah, if you focus somebody on nothing but headlines for a month, Right. Um, and nothing but closing paragraphs for a month, and nothing but every which way you can express a warranty for a month. Huh. Um, uh, they would get significantly better at each of those things in sequence, rather than focusing them on getting better with the entire sales letter, month to month to month to month to month. All right. You know what I just thought? What I just remembered? It, was it Halbert who who coached you on writing out by well, hand? Yeah, Halbert taught everybody. Not that anybody did it, <laughs> but yeah. But that Halbert. could almost qualify then. If 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 I spent well, not you know, I mean, if somebody spent a month. 
Oh, yeah. Doing yeah. that. And, and, and see, specific to, to writing, uh-huh. I'm sure it exists in your thing, but, you know, there's not only the the learning of the mechanics of it, there's a certain muscle memory to it. Right. Um, that you only, you, you don't get it by typing them into the computer. Um, you only get it uh, by by writing it by hand. Mm-hmm. And it, it, the subconscious mind is affected differently. There'd be a long conversation, a neurological set of scientific principles. Yeah, I imagine the same through. thing. The same thing applies somewhat to reading. Yeah, probably. Like yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and I mean, in your world, to actually doing. Yeah. Right. I mean, Sandler's thing. You can't learn to ride a bicycle in the classroom. I mean, at some point in time. Right. Yeah. You can prepare. <laughs> yeah. But at some point in time, you got to get on a bike. Right. Bruce Lee used to say, "You can't, you can't learn to swim standing on dry land." Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, um, so, yeah, Halbert's thing was, you know, you take 500 great headlines and you write them by hand, and you rewrite an entire ad by hand, word for word, exactly the way it is. And I mean, I did a lot of it. Because, uh, um, um, I mean, I guess you know, I was, I was dumb enough to take it at face value. <laughs> uh, um, but um, um, you, you look at somebody like what I have read about Lee, and you know, these people were very dedicated to a craft. Uh, however, it is that you get there, mm-hmm. and again. Most rich people are very dedicated to some craft, um, and again, and there's not a lot of people who are really dedicated to mastering hell anything. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 whether it's personal, you know, recreation or 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 you know whatever. Yeah. Well, so thank you for a very good call. I can let and, you off the hook now. And for all your preparation. <laughs> and. Um, and I hope you found the, not just the call, but the preparation interesting. Very much so. Thank you for listening to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast with Dan Kennedy. If you love hearing in on these lost Dan Kennedy talks and speeches and calls, then please let someone else know about this podcast. That's how you can help it to grow. And the more it grows, the more free Dan Kennedy we can bring to you. Also, Dan would love to give you the most incredible free gift ever, designed to help you make maximum money in minimum time. Now, this free gift comes with almost $20,000 in pure money-making information for free just for saying maybe. You can get this gift from Dan right now at nobsletter.com. Not only will you get the $20,000 gift, you're also going to get a subscription to two marketing newsletters that will be hand-delivered by the mailman to your mailbox each and every month, one from Dan Kennedy and one from me, Russell Brunson. To get this gift and your subscription, go to nobsletter.com right now.